the evolutionists say that if you give time long enough, you will get out the Matterhorn picture, which is life, biology. Uh, Darwin started to preach this, you know, and he did so in his book called The Origin of Species in 1859, and he showed, as he thought, that all life was better explicable on the basis that chance did it. And of course, the English, the British at that time, were very, very pious, and they were up in arms against the preaching of this doctrine that if you shook the machine long enough, you'd get your answer fall out of the bottom. <coughs> they had in 1860 a great debate. This is the great debate, the first one, and all other debates have followed the same, same style. They had that at Oxford, and they asked Bishop Wilberforce, Samuel Wilberforce, uh, who was Professor of Mathematics at Oxford and Bishop of Oxford, both a very, very good theologian and mathematician. They asked him if he'd bait, if he'd debate Huxley. He didn't bait him, he was a very, uh, a very nice man. Uh, so he said he would, and he produced a huge meeting there in Oxford, they arranged that, with the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And they said that they give Wilberforce the first word. So he stood up in a huge concourse of people and he said this. Now this is what most of you would say. What I used to say, and which you can say today if you know how. But you've got to be very careful how you say it. He stood up and he said, all uh, machines must have a creator. Uh, he said, for example, that his watch obviously presupposed a watchmaker because the metal of which the watch is made can't do the mathematics to get the wheels the right size and get the spring the right strength. And therefore, if you see gold and steel put together so nicely so they mathematically parallel the rotation of the earth around the sun and around itself, that that must be information that's put in from outside and wasn't on the metal, although the metal can hold it. And he produced what we used to call Paley's, P-A-L-E-Y, Paley's natural um, theology. He said, if you see a knife, that the knife is sharp, has a handle on it, and that the information to make the sharpness and the handle on it doesn't reside in the metal nor in the wooden handle. Therefore, it must have been put there and a cutler is necessary where a knife is. Well, you can see that argument. And he argued that right through and that argument was valid until 1926 when they pushed it out of the University of Cambridge. It was an entrance examination. To get into Cambridge until then, you had to know that but then they put it away because of evolution. Now, Huxley got up and he said, well, he was very pleased to hear that because that was an old argument and uh, we could easily demolish that. And he asked uh, Bishop Wilberforce if he would give him one or two axioms to work on. So Bishop Wilberforce said, yes, of course he would. And the first thing he says, would you give me six eternal typewriters that don't go wrong? Typewriters had just come out in those days, you see, so it was a thing to take. Oh, uh, well, the bishop said, I don't see why you want six eternal typewriters, but I'll give you them if you want them to argue with. He said, I do. And then he said, I want six apes that don't die. And then I want enormous amounts of paper, infinite amounts of paper to go in the machines, and gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of ink so they don't run out of ink. Well, he said, the bishop, if you want them, he said, you're a professor of mathematics, you can deal with these things, give them me. So he said, okay, he would. Now, said Huxley, you let those apes chained to the typewriter, six and six, you let them type. You let them type at random till eternity is almost past. Well, that'd be a very long time, wouldn't it? He said, yes, that's what we want, it's almost eternity. I like eternity if I could, but he said, I can't 
argue with eternity because we don't have it, but we'll have almost eternity. So the bishop said, okay, he's mystified about this. This is the valid argument today. I'm not talking old hat, you know, here. This was in science, your journal, quite recently. Somebody wrote in, I think it was science, it was an American, uh, scientific American, one or two, uh, <clears throat> wrote in to the editor and said, if you cut out the name of your creator in your journal anymore, I won't buy your paper. And the editor wrote back and said, if you're so ignorant, I don't mind if you don't buy our paper, because you hope this case. Because the argument with Huxley and Wilberforce settled once and for all that chance will do what a creator does if you give it time. And here's the argument which is still valid today. Let your typewriters be typed upon by the apes and let them go. The bishop said, okay, let them go. Now, before time quite ran out, almost at the end of it, we look at what they've typed. Okay? said the bishop, what have they typed? We said, I look through millions and millions of papers and I find one paper with the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside still waters. Well, the bishop almost went purple when he heard that. He said, you mustn't say things like that. But he said, I must. You're a professor of mathematics don't you know the probability formula, bishop? Well now, professor of mathematics couldn't very well say he didn't know the probability formula, could you? I mean, that wouldn't do. So he said, of course I know the, the probability formula. But he said, you believe it? Do you believe it? Well, the bishop said, of course I believe it. Well, he said, don't you see that where P, where T, which is time, equals infinity P which is probability equals 1 that is you've given off time enough for a reaction that's going on typing then you will with certainty get anything and everything out you just let it go long enough and you'll get out the 23rd Psalm but the bishop said the 23rd Psalm was written by David. And here you're saying it wasn't written by David. Oh, no, I'm not, said Huxley. What I'm telling you is that chance can do anything that you can do if you give it time enough. That's the nature of the probability formula. The Earth now is very many billions of years old. And the reactions that make you have been going on all this time. If you give time enough, just as your Carl Sagan says, Life will arise. Therefore, they've been listening and they've been looking. They sent labs to Mars and to Venus to have a look and see how life was coming along. That was just it. I had Irwin in my house with his children recently and I asked him about it. And he said, yes, we were told to look for this rock and that rock and then it would be examined for chemical evolution which was starting. And they never found one chance in five million that there was any sign of chemical evolution at all. Well, Huxley said, so you do see, Bishop, that uh, if you have time enough, all the works of God, including yourself, will be produced. Because where T equals infinity, P, probability, equals 1. Do you understand me, Bishop? Well, poor professor of mathematics had to understand him. So it's only a question of time. And you can do the works of God without God. David's works, made by David, were just as well made by chance, if you give time enough. So you see, all you've got to do is have a very old earth, a very old solar system. And if you touch that question, you know, this is, this is the nitty-gritty of it. This is the neuralgic point 
If you touch the age of the earth and take away the infinite time, you've torn it. You've just about done it, because it all depends on that. That's where you've got to be careful about, you understand me? That's where it turns. Well, the poor old bishop, he was absolutely upset by this. Because you don't really seriously mean that a man like me could have risen by chance. Yes, he said, I believe my mathematics, and obviously you don't. Finished. So the bishop said, look, we can't accept that, because we could say that all the things we have in our civilization were made by chance. Exactly that, said Huxley. That's exactly what I'm telling you. There's no need to have the chance. And what's more, said the bishop, you know, I said Huxley to the bishop, what's more, I put sense into this universe and you put nonsense with your creationism. The bishop said, I don't understand you. Well, he said, it's time you did. Because you see, you've got a world, an earth, a solar system, made as you say, by Jesus Christ, the creator. And it's full of bad things. It's full of cancer, it's full of war, it's full of violence, it's full of death. And those are bad things, aren't they? Yes, indeed they are, said the bishop. When he said, if you've got a good God who made a bad world, that good God is a devil. Okay? Okay? When I got converted, you know, in England many, many years ago, I had a professor of physical chemistry and he heard me witnessing to a student and he stood behind me and he said to me now Wilder Smith I don't want any of this theological nonsense even mentioned in my lab he said you know that I'm a Marxist and indeed I knew it and he said, I'm absolutely convinced that you're intellectually dishonest. And if you're intellectually dishonest, I don't watch in my lab. You can do endless harm with your froth of intellectual dishonesty. Because if God made the world, as you say, and I'll admit that he might have done, then he made it bad, and he made it good. And if he made it bad, he's a devil. And if he made it good, he's an angel. Now, you can't answer those things. Now, you shut up about these things. I've described it in my little book. In my little book, Why Does God Allow It? That was the conversation with my professor shortly after I got converted. He said, you Christians are intellectually dishonest. You say you believe in a good God, and at the same time he's bad. You're just neutralizing what you said, and you said nothing. It's all froth. And all you do is you wallow in emotions. Instead of a bit of common sense which you were made, and you haven't got any. No more. Now, do you understand that? There are plenty... Plenty who believe like that, and unless you can tackle them, unless you can show that you can give a reason at any time for the faith that is in you, you're disobeying a commandment of Jesus. For he said, be ready, the word of God says, be ready at all times to give a reason not just a smile and a song. I like a smile and a song. But you're required, because God made you homo sapiens sapiens, to give a reason. And poor old Wilberforce, you know, when he couldn't give a reason, which sounded reasonably intellectually honest, he never spoke again on that subject. He was killed riding a horse, poor old man, and he never spoke again. He couldn't. He was broken because he publicly dishonored the cause of Christ by being able to, unable to, an to answer. Now, where's the answer? Where's the wrong answer? 
the Holy Scripture says in Romans chapter 1, which I read out to you, that the whole of creation testifies to the deity and Godhead of God. And anybody that doesn't believe that, anybody that doesn't believe that is without excuse. And you know, here was I, a young student, right in the middle of things, and couldn't get an answer. And it hurt me for a long, long time. Do you know I thought 35 years of this sub over this subject? To get an answer to that specific evolutionary great debate. And there it is. It's held in your scientific journals to be the basis of evolutionary theory today. And they hold us to be intellectually lazy and dishonest. That's what they think we are. And you know we are. That's plain fact. It took me 35 years, conscious and unconscious thought, to get this one out. And I did really think about it. It haunted me because, you know, students come and ask me. I've had people say to me, What? Three earned doctorates and half a dozen full professorships and you believe that dribble in the Bible? You believe that? You're dishonest. I've had people say it to me. You read what they write about me. They say, it's incredible. I've had one evolutionist write to three universities where I've got these degrees and say, is this man really qualified? Did he earn those degrees? Because... He believes this drivel which the Bible teaches and doesn't know, obviously, what the other arguments are and he hasn't extricated anybody from his intellectual difficulties. That's what they think. Now we've got to stand up, as Christians you know, a command of God, if we love him, we shall keep his commandments. And one of the commandments is, be ready at all times to give a reason for the faith that's in us. Could you do it tonight? Now I'm going to give you the reason. Are you ready? Have I got you conditioned? You better laugh a bit because if you don't, you'll have no oxygen up there and it'll all go blank and you'll get a spluttery picture like a, a television screen with a car standing outside running with no suppressors on its plugs. And you know what the screen is like then, don't you? And I want you to have a clear screen when you've finished, it's got to be without any sparks and splutters and shifting of, of, of the picture so that you can, in all love and quietness, show that in decency and in honesty you're persuaded that Jesus was the creator who made you. Now I'm going to tell you how it's done. Uh, you won't find it anywhere else because until I wrote it out in Man's Origin, Man's Destiny, and also in the natural sciences know nothing of evolution. This was the picture. Since then, they've refused to take any paper from me because of that reason, for this very reason. Listen, let's do it properly now. I'm going to invent with you and show you at the same time where the error lies because there's an error and there's a mathematical error which poor old Wilberforce didn't see. And you know, you get surprised by an error especially when you're flummoxed on a question uh, it occurred to me this I've been thinking about it and I traveled from Chicago uh, from Wheaton to Chicago and Chicago to Wheaton every day when I was a professor there and you know in Chicago you get lovely weather sometimes it's minus 40 degrees and uh, and it's windy at the same time and you can't even smile because it hurts you to crack a smile, you know. Your face is frozen up. Well, I was in that state. I got out of the train. This is just to give you the interesting side details and see how the Lord works. Uh, I got out of the train and they always heat them up to about uh, 90 or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, in the winter when it's very cold, just to show you don't get cold. And when you get out, you get that windy city blast and the sand and the newspapers in your face as you get out, you know. So I just got out of this train and was still sweating inwardly and outwardly there were almost, uh, you know, ice, 
icicles hanging down my beard and got out and was outside the Chicago Northwestern Station and that wind up that road and I stood on the curb just to go across the pedestrians crossing and an awful amount of traffic and I got blinded by papers and choked by dust and frozen by the wind and I waited and suddenly just as I put my foot onto the pedestrian crossing in no language it just flashed on my mind where the error was and there was enough in there for a whole book the mind is made like that it gives you a flash you'll have experienced it yourself you're all genii here in in um, Pastor Chuck Smith's church aren't you otherwise you wouldn't come now it just simply it just simply the fog cleared away you know like it does here there's something gone do you know what it was it'll take me five minutes to tell it so quickly do thoughts occur in the mind they're absolutely marvelous you know so quick supercomputer uh, you've all got it only needs using that's what it wants doing do listen if you had a typewriter such as Huxley demanded that typewriter this is vital when the ape presses his thumb on key A key A comes the A comes from his brain down his arm through his finger onto the key and the key goes through onto the paper and he puts A on the paper and when he lifts his thumb the A stays on the paper now when he presses B B comes down from his brain through his arm through his thumb onto the key B goes through the machine puts B on the paper okay and right through to Z it does it like that doesn't it now you see that paper that machine with its paper in it is a system are you listening which types but doesn't untype it only types in but it doesn't type out now that's very remarkable because nature isn't like that you know all the chemical reactions of which we're made they type in but they type out let me make it clear to you the new typewriter that I have is a Wilder Smith special is going to make me billions of dollars one day when my ship come when my ship comes home and it has on the right hand side of it it has on the right hand side of it to you what we call a lever but we call it you call it a lever don't you so just to speak by interpretation you know uh, I have to do this in Pastor Chuck Smith's church because he wouldn't allow me to speak without interpretation so I'm going to give it you in, <laughs> I'm going to give it you by, by interpretation <laughs> I thoroughly agree with him don't worry about that ladies and gentlemen uh, I, I, I conform and willingly now this one has a little lever then which when you push it to the right are you with me when you push it to the right the lever under the keyboard it types in like an ordinary typewriter you can type a letter with it okay it types in but it's irreversible and if you make a mistake you have to scratch and pick for the scratch and pick method you know to get the thing out or type it te x tip over it or something like that uh, calcium sulfate so that you cover up your mistake but it doesn't remove the letter the letter stays there because the thing types in but not out now with my new super typewriter you push the lever at uh, the lever pardon me you push the lever to the left not to the right to the left and then you have this super machine that when the ape types on it a a comes down from his beautiful little head down through his arms onto the a goes into the machine okay everything normal everything in order everything under control but when he lifts his thumb and lets the key up the A that he's typed untypes itself rises without a trace with no trace from the paper goes back through the machine up through his thumb back into his head now <laughs> just let me make this quite clear because if you miss this point ladies and gentlemen you will sink to the bottom of the pond 
and I shan't be able to rescue you. If he takes B and he wants to take B, he takes the B, puts it down through his arm, because he's an executive, you see. Uh, he puts it down and types B, and the B goes very faithfully onto the paper. There's B there. But as soon as he lifts his thumb, or his finger, the B rises without a trace from the paper, goes back through the B key, up through his arm, back into his little brain. So this machine types and untypes in equilibrium. It'll type in and it'll type out. Just like all the chemical reactions of your body. They'll type in and they'll type out. Now, ladies and gentlemen, how long would Huxley have had to allow his apes to type to get out the 23rd Psalm on a machine like that? How long? How long? I want to get a sensible answer. You've got enough oxyhemoglobin up top and God gave you a perfectly good brain if you've only used it and kept it nice and supple in working order. How long would you have to type to get out the 23rd Psalm by chance? You'd never get it. Because you see, after you've typed one nanosecond, you've untyped one nanos in one nanosecond as much as you've typed. If you type a billion years, you've got no further forward. Because every letter you type in, types out. It's completely reversible. You can't do it. There lies the error. You see, the body, the chemistry, upon which you ride and which you use to think and act with, the chemistry types in and types out. It is totally and completely reversible. Proved by the fact that even to get the simplest form of life, you need enzymes which catalyze the coming to equilibrium of all the reactions of which you're made. So all these reactions are reversible. You take the simple ones of Fox and Miller, where he makes his amino acids, and then he says they will combine with one another to form proteins. They won't, unless you make them. And unless you put the lever over to the right-hand side, which you do with the program, if you do that, then you can get on and you can synthesize and you could write the 23rd Psalm but organic nature is made like my super Wilder Smith machine it types in and it types out and there's one slight difficulty it types out rather more quickly than it types in due to the second law of thermodynamics so you certainly will never 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 get out by Darwinian processes, which Darwin suggested, you will never get a synthesis done. The only way to get a synthesis to produce nature, to produce the 23rd Psalm, is to introduce a means by which you can stop the typing out and force and encourage the typing in. Now that means, I can't go into it now because I haven't time, that means that you've got to have programming to say, hi, you can go in, but you can't come out again. Now, programming means that you put in a surprise effect. The surprise effect is this, that normally you'd expect it to go in, if you know your chemistry, the typing, and you'd expect it to come equally quickly out. You type in and type out. That's what we normally expect. And in order to stop that, that's the law of nature. In order to stop that, you've got to program the machine with your genes and say, hey, in, but there you stay. And you don't come out again. And that's not a law of nature. That's a law of programming. And programming is the function of the genetic code. And the genetic code does not, being full of information or surprise effects, ever arise alone. 
Now, you see what Huxley had done and how he'd swindled. It's what we call sleight of hand. Nobody guessed that the typewriters that he'd used were really, are you listening? They were really creation machines. They allowed you to go in and they didn't allow you to go out because they're machines. But nature, without right typewriters, organic nature, organic chemical reactions, are not like that. They allow you to go in slightly less easily than they allow you to go out. And therefore you can't synthesize with them. The only way to do it is to get a program put in, either from the head of a biochemist or from the program of the uh, genetic code, which will then do it. So if you had a machine, a typewriter, which is really like nature, which Huxley was using, you'd have to make it like my typewriter, with the lever in the left position. And then you'd see immediately where his error was. His probability formula will only work where it's irreversible. It won't work where it's reversible. Now, Prigogine, two years ago, got the Nobel Prize for seeing that. I've written it in my Man's Origin, Man's Destiny about 12 years before. But you see, the important thing is... No, 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 I, I, I don't mean that at all. Uh, I don't mean that at all. It's so simple uh, when you make it clear, such as I've tried to do tonight, that any school child can see it. But if you wrap it up in very complicated formulae, they won't, and they think it's a new invention. It's as old as the hills. That we remove, we remove the equilibrium, and you put your system far away from equilibrium, as Prigogine says, then your reaction will go forward. That's what he said. And that's the case. But he uses it to say that there's no necessity for a creation. If you just take it away from equilibrium, we don't need a creator. It will happen then. But he's forgotten to say that only a program will do that. And programs don't arise by chance. Now, let's uh, just look at one more thing. The typewriter, as I've said, is my typewriter, the ordinary typewriter, not my typewriter, the ordinary typewriter is a creation machine. It makes a decision every time you push a key. And the decision is this. It's automatic and inbuilt. The decision is this, that you, A, will go in, but A, you won't come out. In nature, you'd expect A to go in and then A to come out because organic reactions are that way. So what you've done is you've inserted in Huxley's typewriter the principle of creation. Every time that you press a button in Huxley's typewriter, you get one bit of information, which is not a natural law, but which is a surprise effect injected into the system. Now, if a typewriter is a machine, which injects every time you touch it one decision, you are injecting information or surprise effects, and your machine is in effect really and truly a creation machine. So Huxley in reality had shown that in order to get the 23rd Psalm out, because the machine is a weak creation machine, you need a long time. But one thing he didn't do, he did not show that you can make the 23rd psalm without creative ability. That is putting in the creation effect of a decision you go in, but you don't come out. Okay? So he really proved creation very neatly. But he, he never let on. I don't think he ever saw it.